All right, welcome to uh, First Good Shepherd's uh, one-year Bible study. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at Samuel, First uh, Samuel, excuse me, uh, twenty-one through Second Samuel six, uh, verse twenty-three. Um, that is going to be in the one-year Bible. Again, you can get that uh, online and um, work with us online if you've not already received the book, or you can also go to oneyearbible.com and order the book as well. Uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and uh, jump into a word of prayer, and then we'll um, get this party going. All right, uh, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and share your word. And uh, Father, we ask you to be it, uh, let it be a blessing and let it be uh, enlightening and truthful. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for showing up, and um, look forward to uh, getting into this. All right, let's go ahead and get into uh, this chunk of the lesson for this week. Um, the purpose statement, to unify and encourage us in our walk with the Lord and with one another. So the message for the church this year is unification in the church. So we're trying to kind of keep a bird's eye view on that as we walk through the uh, different lessons and just, you know, the Bible in general is the unification portion of it is really what we're kind of trying to focus on in the church. So um, we start off on the uh, notes for this with the historical overview. God anointed uh, Saul king. Uh, he also anointed David king. We might think that given the chance, David would quickly kill Saul and take Saul's place on Israel's throne. Uh, this is not the case, however. David respects and honors uh, Saul as God's chosen leader, although it would seem that Saul would dispatch David in a moment's notice. David, when presented with opportunities to kill Saul, does not do so. No matter how much Saul mistreated him, David chose to put the best complexion on everything as God commands in the Eighth Commandment. While David follows God's desires, Saul falls deeper and deeper into ungodly behavior. At one point, Saul even consults a medium. When we read that uh, Samuel came to Saul through this medium, we may falsely conclude that it is permissible to consult them. God strictly forbids this. In fact, mediums are to be put to death. Uh, see Leviticus 20:27. 20, Did the real prophet appear to Saul? Luther enlightens us by saying evil spirits have produced many wicked tricks by appearing as the souls of the departed. It seems as although evil spirits were conjured, God commanded that they speak the truth to Saul. Indeed, his reign as king would come to a tragic end on Mount Gilboa. Samuel, uh, Second Samuel. It must be noted that First and Second Samuel were originally one document. When uh, was this no longer divided? When was this? Uh, longer document divided? That's a good question. Some believe that the division occurred when the original Hebrew text was translated into Greek in the Septuagint in 132 BC. The life of King David is chronicled in this book. So let's see here. On two occasions, David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but did not. What does this say about David's faith? And our second uh, question in the Old Testament, or second topic, or point of interest, so to speak, in the Old Testament reading this week, is why does Saul um, vacillate between loving and hating David? Uh, what does the devil use to turn Saul against David, who is also the Lord's anointed? Okay. So let's take a step back real quick, and um, as I kind of like to do in general, if anybody's kind of followed along with me and the way that I kind of think, um, I like to kind of do a, a quick overview on kind of what we're looking at um, before we kind of dig into it. So let's just uh, let's back this train up just a little bit. So a couple of things um, that we touched on on this. Um, one of them is the scrolls. So yes, it's um, very, very um, accepted that these were all one scrolls and broken down into separate scrolls, uh, most likely just for the length of the documents. Um, we see this in a couple of different places as well throughout 
um, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. We see um, a handful of these that were just broken, um, just for easier um, scribe length and uh, translation, and just kind of putting the whole thing together. Um, the next thing that um, we should look at in here as well is a couple of different concepts. So we've got um, Samuel, uh, which is just coming out of um, the book of uh, Judges. So really what we're seeing is the final judge, uh, which is Samuel in this particular case. And Samuel is kind of tasked with uh, handing off the reins and um, putting into place actually a uh, kingship. And it's in this book that we actually start to see the development and the change of a tribal nation turning into a full-on nation um, where they actually become uh, confederated or they become one uh, centralized uh, government, so to speak. Um, this is one of the things that Samuel comes back and actually um, starts to point out to them and says, hey, look, you know, kings are costly. They're going to cost a lot. And when it all comes down to it, you know, there's infrastructure costs. It's going to you're going to take your daughters and we're going to put them into the house, uh, you know, for cooking and cleaning. We're going to take the boys and we're going to put them into the military. And we're going to put them into the, uh, you know, into the, you know, the, the uh, uh, nation's, you know, processes and they'll become kind of, you know, just additional uh, necessities for, you know, maintaining and running the government. And we kind of see that in our own government as it stands. There's kind of certain processes and people that need to be put into place that we wouldn't normally need if we didn't have a government, so to speak. So although Saul, Samuel, excuse me, starts to, um, you know, tries to persuade them, um, to go another route, they just they don't. They just simply choose not to. I mean, when it's all said and done, their primary focus is they definitely want a king, and um, God relents and says, "You know what? Fine. If you want a king, then let's go ahead and do this." Now, when it goes through the process of picking the king, they actually end up picking um, Saul. Um, Saul is uh, literally a head taller than everybody else, and he's a very, very good-looking man, and um, he seems to be the best fit for the job, for the image of, uh, of a king. So Saul gets anointed into this position. The challenge that we start to see with this is that Saul himself has some huge, huge character um, traits that are um, flawed. And those character traits start to kind of um, transcend throughout this entire book and actually go through his rise and um, inevitably start pointing to actually his fall and what was really the, the primary problem. Um, Saul really had an issue with uh, anybody uh, being uh, exalted above him. So um, there's actually in the first portion of this, we run into a little passage in regards to his son, Jonathan, who actually turns out to be a really, really good friend of David. But he, he actually runs into this, this passage of Jonathan as his son. And he had sent him out to battle. And uh, Jonathan did great. He came back and he had won the campaign. And um, his father was proud. Saul was proud of him. That's my boy. He went out there and took care of business. Um, but Jonathan actually goes on to a campaign onto his own. So he doesn't speak to his dad about it, doesn't talk to Saul about it. He goes out and he's successful, does a great job at it. And people are you know, pointing to Jonathan and, uh, and they're kind of giving him some praise and they're, they're, you know, hey, you did a good job and, you know, job well done and the whole nine yards. But his father, Saul, actually starts to see these kind of seeds of jealousy that kind of start kicking in. And this is actually his, um, what's interesting about this, this is his son. You know, traditionally when your son does well and you've done well as a father and they go out and they just start doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, you know, traditionally as a father, you're proud of that. You know, that's, that's something that, that you did you did good. And But instead of Saul taking pride in the fact that his son is, is doing the right thing and taking pride that... Um, you know, that was something that was given to him through the father and, and you know, through parenting and the whole nine yards. And so he kind of goes another route with this. And his position is a little bit more upset that um, Jonathan is actually kind of getting some of the um, spotlight when it's really, you know, King Saul who should be getting it all. This um, turns into an issue for Saul all the way on down the line. And eventually we end up into a challenge with uh, David. Um, the same exact concept goes into place. Um, David is uh, anointed king. 
um, by Samuel, but he is not instructed to take the throne. Uh, and for the most part, Saul's okay with it. And, you know, there's a period of time there where David is a general in the army and he's going out and he's fighting and he's doing, he's doing a great job. He's actually doing exactly what Saul's asking him to do. He's playing music for him. Um, there's a, um, there's a relationship that's going to be putting, uh, that's been set in place and put in place. There's also a time here where David actually uh, goes out on a massive campaign and he comes back. And after this campaign, they're um, singing praises to him, um, kind of similar to Jonathan. They're singing praises to him. And at this point, they're, you know, they're saying, hey, you know, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And this, too, then starts to kind of get under um, Saul's skin. He starts to get, a, you know, again, prideful about this whole entire process. You know, in essence, that he's the king and he should really be the one that, that receives the focus. So this kind of sets the stage for exactly what happens and why David is kind of being pursued and, and what's going on with this. And it really comes into this issue of an insecurity. You know, ultimately... Um, Saul had, you know, some other character flaws. And one of those primary character flaws is he just didn't listen is really what the biggest issue was. So one of the challenges, um, there was a time when he was told to go take a fortification. He goes in and takes the fortification. Samuel told him, point, point, look, don't do anything. I'm going to make the sacrifice when I get there. Well, Saul, being Saul, decides that... Uh, Samuel's taking too long, so he goes ahead and puts a sacrifice in place and does the sacrifice on, on his own. Um, Samuel gets there, confronts him, and explains to him, "Hey, look, I was very specific about what I told you to do, and this is the, you know you've kind of this is a road that we've walked down a couple of times already." And um, Saul's still not really getting it. So it's at this point that the actual spirit of the Lord actually leaves him, and Saul then moves on to this next process. Now. In this, uh, in this mix, as we're going through this and kind of watching this whole thing kind of start to unfold and play out, we see some of the challenges with uh, Saul. But at the same time that this is happening, at the same time that we're seeing this, in this rise of Saul and this decline of Saul, we're also seeing this rise of David that's taking place. And we're also going to see David go into his own decline as well. So as this kind of starts to take place, we end up into this position where Saul is now pretty much um, aware that David is uh, going to be the next king. David uh, has uh, been a general in the army and actually has uh, people that are sticking with him. They're on his side and, and they believe that um, first off, they know that he's the next king. And second off, they don't they have worked with him and fought with him and know that he's a good and a, and a just man, knows that his heart's in the right place. Uh, David gets a couple of opportunities to kill Saul, um, does not choose to kill Saul. In fact, even points out the fact that I could have killed you, but I didn't kill you. And there's a few places in here where Saul even repents. And he's kind of like, you know what, I'm sorry, man. Let's let's just, you know, let's 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 put this whole thing behind us. But it's quick and it's um, goes right back into the chase again. Eventually, Saul um, ends up in a battle with uh, in uh, on Mount Gilibo and he ends up dying. I believe it's the Philistines actually that come in and, and uh, kind of take him. And Jonathan ends up dying as well and kind of hung on some posts outside. Um, what's interesting about this is although that David had multiple opportunities to go in and um, take the throne that he had already been given, um, he chose not to. He chose to wait for God, um, even though there was a um, huge, huge pressure that was on top of him. Namely, Saul was literally hunting him down. He, he wanted him dead. So for David to have just simply killed Saul, that would have really solved an immediate problem for him, which was um, you know, basically him being hunted. But he chose not to do that. So, that, you know, there's a couple of layers of trust when you really start looking at this and what David had put into place. Number one, he put his life in God's hands and said, look, I, I trust you, Lord. I, I know that this is something that I could do right now. I, I know that, that this is an opportunity for me. But um, I also know that, that, that you're God and that, that you have a plan and that this would not be the right way for the throne to be taken. So... 
he is not only trusting that God is going to deliver the throne ship to David, but in the meantime, he's also trusting that God is going to um, continue to keep him safe during this entire process as he's going through this. So what's interesting, too, is, um, you know, a, a bunch of the Psalms that were written um, were written by David, and the, a large chunk of those were written like specifically during this season right here, where he's kind of in this place of running and um, knowing that he has opportunities to make this all stop, but chooses not to. Still continues to follow and let the Lord continue to guide. So, in this process, um, you know, eventually, you know, Saul ends up dying. And David is then uh, it takes the throne. So in David's rise, we actually see this uh, shepherd boy that ends up getting chosen. And this uh, shepherd boy goes out first. He uh, confronts um, the Philistines. And one of the battles that he confronts them in is uh, a huge battle that was actually about to take place. And they had a, a choice in those days. And one of those choices was to take a hero from each side and um, he would let those heroes fight it out. And whoever won um, would be the, the, the winner of the battle. And then at that point, it would be a negotiation of you know what was going to be given and how it was going to be given and processed. And the idea was that it was um, a um, amicable way of uh, saving blood. Basically, there's no sense for everybody to die. You know, I mean, we take a couple of our best out there. We let those guys bang it out. Whoever wins, wins, and then we just kind of honor that decision and we kind of treat that as the as the war, as the battle, so to speak. So this is the mindset of what's happening. And uh, the Philistines have this huge, huge giant of a man. And David is a, um, he's a little fella, in fact, and uh, he's a musician and he's a uh, sheep herder. So not really military material at, at this time, um, but uh, what he does have is a heart after God. And he trusts God and he believes that um, God will deliver Israel. So David goes and confronts uh, Goliath. Um, I mean, we're all familiar with this story. David goes and confronts Goliath when it's all said and done. Obviously, Goliath falls. We see that the victory goes to the Lord. David honors uh, Goliath in this whole process. So this is kind of where this this um, process for David starts to come into play. You know, some of the things that are interesting that are often left out about this as well is that you know, David had already fought lions and bears by the time he got to Goliath. So Goliath really you know, on one sense really wasn't as intimidating to David as he was to everyone else um, I mean if, if you can kind of picture in your head tangling with a lion or a bear uh, I think that when it, it comes to a place when you're just fighting a regular man uh, regardless of the size I think if you had a choice you'd rather fight the man than a lion or another bear so uh, you know, David was provisioned for this. He was prepared for this. He went in with a lot of confidence, not only because of God and knowing who God was, but also because God had kind of taken him down this road to build him up for a day such as this. And, um, you know, we see something like that for um, Esther, actually, in the book of Esther, when we start getting into that as well, where God really goes into place to, to put people in certain positions for specific reasons. And he goes ahead of time and prepares them and makes sure that they're ready to do the tasks that need to be done. We see this with Moses, for example. Uh, Moses was highly educated in um, Egypt, which actually made him the... Uh, the perfect narrator for the Torah. Um, as you go through, you just kind of see where, where God just prepares the path ahead of time. And um, as his uh, prophets and as his disciples move forward on those paths, you watch how different things um, unfold all according to God's will. Again, you know, it's important to remember, too, that the Biblia is actually God's history. It's not the Israelites' history. It's not our history. It's God's history. These are the things that were important to God. And that's why they're recorded in here. And that's why they're recorded the way that they're recorded. So as we start to go through this, we start to see this rise of David. Um, we see a very, very honorable man um, take the throne in, in an honorable way. Um, one of the first things he does is uh, take over um, the... Uh, city of Zion, which was uh, uh, run by the Jeju uh, Jeju Jeju Jesuits, I believe, at that time. 
and uh, he basically went in and, and took it over, renamed it as uh, Zion, and then uh, later uh, it will become Jerusalem. But this is really where the foundation of this becomes. It becomes the capital city of Israel at that point. Um, it's in this uh, city, in fact, um, where David's uh, biggest you know, downfall comes in and where um, actually the, the pinnacle and the peak of Israel um, is uh, marked by his uh, failure. So uh, at this point, we watch David um, really not do anything wrong. I mean, you know, for the most part, he's just been a stellar, stellar young man, a stellar military leader and um, a great king at this point. He's unified the tribes, he's taken lands, he's uh, put peace in place, um, you know, armies are now being assembled, um, you know, things are just kind of falling into place. We've got centralized government at this point. One of the things that ends up happening is um, there's a battle that's going on and uh, when David should actually be out leading this battle, uh, he's at home. He decides to stay home. He's going to sit this one out. And when he does, he um, happens to see a very beautiful young woman bathing on a uh, rooftop. And this woman is uh, spoken for, and um, David chooses to uh, dishonor that uh, marriage covenant. In fact, he dishonors it to the point where he actually kills the husband of the woman that uh, David is lusting after. This. Uh, whole episode is the beginning of the downfall for David. Um, one of the prophets, Nathan, come and actually confront him, and David's fully aware of what he does. Is he's what he's done is wrong, and he um, repents and laments. Um, but uh, there's consequences for his actions. Um, we see the loss of his son, and then we also see a tragic, tragic. Uh, mess that takes place in between his remaining children. Um, one of his children, Tamar, gets uh, raped by her brother. When the other brother finds out about that, Absalom, he decides to have him you know, assassinated. So basically when David loses one of his kids, the other one gets raped. And the reason that he loses his kid is because one of his other kid kills him. Not only that, but Absalom then determines that uh, he should actually be the rightful king, and he starts chasing his own father. So now David finds himself back out in the desert, um, being chased by another king, uh, even though he's the rightful uh, he's the rightful throne holder. So eventually, Absalom dies in a battle, and David ends up taking his uh, throne back. And um, we just see this brokenness of David throughout this entire process of this whole thing going down. And from here, uh, David actually starts the process of wanting to build a uh, temple for God. And it's when God um, denies him, tells him no, but instead I'm going to build you a house. And um, it's basically going to be a dynasty. Uh, one of the most important books in uh uh, chapters in this in Samuel and Second Samuel specifically is going to be Samuel chapter seven. Second Samuel chapter seven. Um, I highly recommend that you go through that chapter a handful of times. This is basically the chapter that all of the prophets start referencing back to when they start talking about this new messianic king and what's going to what it's going to look like and how this whole process is going to start to unfold. It's right here is where they start referencing all that. And oftentimes when we go through the Bible, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is the way that um, God has kind of laid this whole thing out is we get little, little pieces. And then as we go farther on, those pieces get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until we actually kind of get a fuller picture of, in, of entirely what it is that he's talking about. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, we run into this concept of uh of uh, Jesus, basically this serpent crusher, this king that is going to come. And when he does, he's going to set right the wrong that had taken place, the separation between God and man when uh, humanity chose to take autonomy for itself. 
This is all going to be put right in Genesis chapter 3, but we don't really see how or where or what are those processes are. The next piece that really starts to give us a little bit more insight on this is going to be 2 Samuel um, chapter 7. So um, this too is important again because the prophets are going to start. Isaiah is going to build on this. Ezekiel is going to build on this. Jeremiah is going to build on this. And we're going to see that as we start walking through these prophets um, as the fall of Israel starts to come into place and as the prophets come in, these mouthpieces of God come in and start um, proclaiming what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. So that basically kind of gives us a, a breakdown of uh, what this book is and some of the nuts and bolts that are in it. Um, we've got you know three primary players. We've got Samuel, who's the last of the judges, who's now handing off this, uh, this baton to this new leadership. This new leadership is actually going to be a, a full-on kingship, which is going to start the assembly of a nation, so to speak. So then we've got Samuel, who hands it off to Saul. Saul, um, all of the tribes at this, still tribal at this point, all the tribes come together and agree that um, he is the king, and we're gonna listen to what he has to say. And then David takes it a step farther and actually, you know, consolidates this all into one, you know, one solid nation, sets up an actual capital in Zion or Jerusalem. And um, that basically starts the foundational pieces for um, Israel itself and, and who Israel is to become. So it's really interesting because we see two kings that actually kind of rise and fall. Um, and we see how this whole process is uh, being put together. And um, we actually also to see some of the mercy that God has put into place. And, um, you know, how you can, you can truly be a mess and still have a heart after God. You know, it, it, David wasn't perfect. And we see that very, very clearly in 2 Samuel. Yet God specifically said that David was a man after his own heart. And I think that once you start reading through the Psalms, you can really start to understand why God would say something like that. His trust in God and his faith in God and his just raw love for God is uh, it flows throughout the Psalms as you go through and, and look at these. Um, we also, you know, in Psalms are, you know, praise and lament. So we, we, we see this kind of roller coaster that David is, you know, running on here. And you can kind of see it through the backbone of this rise up into kingship and everything just being just as perfect as it could possibly be. And then watching this whole thing kind of spiral out of control. Um, and then kind of regroup itself at the end, which is um, the, you know, the next piece of this or the foundational piece of this is where we actually see Solomon come into place. So, again, uh, very, uh, very interesting how God kind of assembled this. And, um, you know, oftentimes we kind of need to look at these things and see, well, what was it that was important to God? Why was this important to God's history? And, um these are some of the pieces that we're looking for. This book opens up with um, a poem from Hannah. And one of the primary concepts that we really start to see laid out in this is how um, God exalts the humble and brings low the prideful. You know, one of the things that David had done um, that uh, kind of spoke to this next layer of pride that doesn't get touched on too often is he started to do a count, and there's nothing wrong with doing a count, but he did the count for his own reasons. He did it so that he could kind of figure out exactly how big his britches were. It wasn't commanded by God. God didn't ask him to do that. That was something that he wanted to do all onto his own. So as you start you know, kind of seeing some of the different pieces here and some of the different things that are put into play, um, it's easy to, to you know, kind of overlook some of the smaller little details, but that would be something that um, I, you know, I would put a little spotlight on there and just show that you know through this process we start to see you know some of the uh, failings of even David. I mean, even David, and I love David. I think he's awesome. I think he did a great job, but we see where there's some challenges in here. Um, this book does not do a, a whole lot to, to really you know glean him in a, in a really really good light. Um, when you get into First and Second Chronicles, we're going to see a little bit more information about David and some of the other things that he done, uh, had done 
um, which was you know preparing of the temple and getting everything ready for Solomon so that it was time to actually start laying the brick that uh, it was prepared it was ready to go so we see a couple of other little pieces in there as well um, but anyway this kind of summarizes and gives you an, a topical overview of what we're looking at in the book of Samuel so let's kind of jump back into the two questions that we had so on two occasions David had the opportunity to kill Saul but did not what does this say about David's faith well, you know, based on the overview that we talked about, what it says is that David was putting all of his trust, all of his hope, all of his wants, needs, and desires in God's hands. And although he had every opportunity to seize that for himself, he chose not to. So where Adam had gone in and said, you know what, I'm going to take this all unto myself, David chose not to. David saw the opportunity, had multiple opportunities, but still each time chose to put it into God's hands. So, again, one of those things that is just, you know, uniquely different um, about David is his um, ability to, uh, you know, withstand, you know, certain temptations. You know, what's interesting about that is the temptation for him to save his life um, was easily easy for him to uh, uh, to reconcile. But the temptation of a beautiful woman was something that was a little bit more complicated for David. So as you go through and kind of think about, you know, some of these different pieces and how some of these different dots connect up, it's not necessarily that David wasn't able to withstand the temptation that was there. It's that he didn't. And there was consequences for that. Um, you know, unfortunately, David was uh, the leader of Israel. And also, too, we must keep in mind that oftentimes, you know, God's judgment at this time wasn't singular. It was corporate. So we see a lot of stuff that had taken place where, look, you, you know, if you blow it, it's going to be on your sons and it's going to be on your son's sons and your son's son's sons. It's a generational deal, some of them even up to 10 generations. So. You know, there's a lot of things that are really kind of taking place in here. And there's a lot of different things that God could have done according to his previous justice and the way that he normally had worked. Um, but we, you know, we kind of see where, where even God relented in this particular case. We didn't we don't we don't see some of that harshness that, that we would have traditionally seen. Um, maybe that's because he knew David's heart. You know, ultimately, David did have a good heart. He just made a terrible, terrible, terrible terrible mistake so the next is uh, why does Saul um, kind of volley between uh, loving and hating David and what does the devil use to turn Saul against David uh, who is also the Lord's anointed so Basically, Saul kind of flips and flops in between this because first off, he's got Samuel, right? So Samuel is this um, is a judge and he's speaking directly to God and he's getting insight on what he should and shouldn't be doing. So there's still a, a connection that is there. I mean, it's it's we're starting to see it, it fraying and, and missing the mark, but there's still a connection. There's points when when he is right, when he's right on point doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. But there's other times when he's just missing the mark, no matter how much he's trying or not trying. He's just missing the connection for these pieces. So. As you go through this, you know, one side of this is he knows what he's doing is wrong. You know, the scripture tells us point blank that the law is written on our heart. He knows what he is doing is wrong. The other side of that is that, um, you know, we live in two common states. And this is something that I share all the time when I'm witnessing. One of the, We live in the state of fear. Or we live in the state of love. If we live in the state of fear, then the things that are a direct result of that are going to be deceit, lying, anger, um, short-temperedness, all of these things are the foundational and hallmarks of fear. These things all come into place when you have some level of fear. Why do you lie? Because you're afraid about something. Why do you steal something? Because you're afraid you can't have it. All of these things kind of come into this fear, uh, uh, fear um, spectrum. The other side of that is the love side of things, where you have confidence, sound mind, peace, comfort, um, you don't lack, um, you're generous, um, respectful, self-control, all of these things come out of the, the side of the love spectrum. So 
we've got these two dichotomies that we both kind of, we all live in, no matter what the scenario is. And Saul's, you know, Saul's not immune to that whatsoever. So on one hand, he knows exactly what he's doing is wrong. But on the other hand, he's also fearful that David's going to, uh, you know, move up the ladder before him, possibly even abdicate him. And, you know, one of the other challenges is he wants to know about his family, you know, how my boy's going to be taking care of my wife's, my, you know, all the stuff that I've already built up in place. You know, I kind of put my time in. What about the stuff that I've already done? So he, you know, there's some, there's some serious concerns that he's looking at from his side. Um, but what we're seeing here is a very distinct difference in between the two. So one of them is very much so on the page of you know, God's going to take care of it. And even though that there's an opportunity that's sitting right in front of me, I'm not going to seize that opportunity because it's God's choice. It's God's opportunity to do this. It's God's battle. It's God's determination on when I take the throne, not when I take the throne. And even though that this feels like it would be a good opportunity for me, even though it seems like it would be a good opportunity for me, I'm not going to do it because it's just not the right thing to do. Saul had a different attitude about that, actually kind of almost a polar opposite attitude about that. If there's an opportunity for me to do it, then I'm going to do it. Saul also had a massive issue with anger. and He was quick to toss the spear out when, when he got a little upset about things. Um, you know, self-control. Again, you know, you start looking at some of these different pieces. You know, where was Saul operating from? Saul was operating squarely, squarely from the sphere of, uh, from the sphere of fear where David was um, operating from this sphere of love. Um, and, you know, and we see that too. I mean, ultimately, David loved Saul. And when Saul died, he lamented and cried for him. The same way that when his son died, Absalom died, he lamented and cried for him. So two very different hearts in this, in this scenario. But if we were to look at that and say, well, what was the big difference there? We would say that, you know, Saul basically gave in to his temptation where David did not. Put it into a nutshell. The uh, main thing that the devil used in order to persuade Saul um, was fear. I mean, ultimately, that's what he uses to persuade us all is, you know, fear. Um, when it's all said and done, uh, and that was really what was his greatest downfall was, was fear. Um, he leveraged pride as the tool to provoke that downfall of fear, but ultimately what was it? Fear. So that kind of wraps up this uh, portion of the Old Testament through First uh, Samuel and uh, Second Samuel. Um, we've got uh, some more that's going to be coming next week. Again, next week is going to be jumping into Second Samuel um, 7. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important that particular chapter is. And um, it's one of those ones that um, I would read a, a minimum of two or three times um, just to make sure that you're fully getting it because it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to come up again. And it, it's a, it's, this is a pivot chapter. This is one of those, like Genesis chapter 3, um, 15, that this is another one right here. This entire chapter, chapter 7, is a huge, huge chapter on how some of these dots get connected from the prophets and why the prophets are saying the things that they say and where they're getting their information from. They weren't just flippantly coming up with it. It wasn't new revelation for them. This is the core piece for that. God just gave them additional information to build on to it. So again, this is a huge, 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 huge book. Um, we're seeing another massive transitional piece here. We're seeing the transition from the judges into an actual kingship. We're seeing a transition from a tribal nation into a full-on um, into a full-on dynasty that's coming into place. Um, the dynasty of David, King David, in fact. So uh, that pretty much kind of wraps up this particular piece of it. Um, I thank you guys for uh, hanging in there. We're going to go ahead and jump into our next section of this, which is uh, actually going to be the uh, New Testament readings. So uh, thank you for hanging in there, and uh, we'll get back here soon. All right, we're going to be looking at uh, the New Testament portion of the uh, One Year Bible. And this piece is going to be uh, chapter 9, 1 through 14. Uh, 14. So uh, the uh, notes that we have uh, say the uh, New Testament historical background. Jesus' bold proclamation that he and the Father are one comes as a contradiction to scholars who feel that Jesus never claimed to be divine. So, to 
Jesus' proclamation that the Father is in me and I am in the Father uh, contradicts this as uh, contradicts this false contention. Should one doubt that Christ is divine, one really has to look no farther, no further than uh, that what he does next. Beyond any doubt, the resurrection of Lazarus put to rest the notion just in case one does not take Jesus' own word as fact enough that he is divine. As we move deeper into our reading for this week, we learn that many come, came to believe in Jesus following the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Uh, others, however, made the trek from Bethany to Jerusalem and poured the information into the, uh, about Jesus and Lazarus into the ears of the Pharisees. The question soon became, what do we do with Jesus? If he continues to go on like this, everyone will believe him and the Romans will soon come and take away our freedoms we have. This question remains a uh, dividing point to this day. Many still ask, what do we do with Jesus? And instead of seeing him through the eyes of faith as the Son of God, author of their redemption, they turn a blind eye to him and walk away. So the first piece that we're looking at here is um, we've got about five chapters that we're looking at uh, the chapter sections that we're kind of reviewing are going to be in the um, Jewish feast so the Jewish feasts um, the book of John kind of breaks down into um, roughly seven pieces you've got a introduction you've got um, miraculous signs and controversies you've got uh, the rising of Lazarus which is actually the uh, turning point um, in this uh, particular book um, we've also got Jesus' final words, uh, the death and resurrection, and then the epilogue. So as we go through this, we're actually going to be picking up in the, um, uh, I guess you'd say the third section of this, and this is the uh, four uh, Jewish feasts, the feast ceremonies. So we've got the um, Sabbath, the Passover. Um, for this week's reading, we're going to be picking up into the uh, tabernacle and uh, Hanukkah. So the tabernacle is basically a recount of what had happened in the wilderness. And in this particular piece, Jesus is standing up and he's saying that I am the uh, water. And if anybody is thirsty, come to me and drink. Uh, this also two points back to where Moses had struck the rock and the water came from the rock and, the rock and was uh, then providing life. Um, we also get this concept of I am the light of the world as well. And this is um, going back to when the cloud and the fire um, was, uh, you know, hearkening over the uh, covenant or the Ark of the Covenant as it was uh, passing through the wilderness. So couple of interesting connections as we go into that. We've also got Hanukkah, which is the rededication of the temple. Um, Jesus at this point is saying that he and the Father are one, and this too is um, you know, symbolic of this new dedication that's going to come into place, um, as well as the Passover that we're going to see e even more as he's going to get into a little bit more depth on that. Um, in 11 and 12, uh, we get into the rising of Lazarus. Jesus is very much so aware that uh, Lazarus is uh, dead. The disciples are not. He actually informs them. They head to um, Mar uh, Mary and Martha, uh, Jerusalem, basically. Um, also, to Thomas is fully aware that um, heading back to Jerusalem is going to potentially mean the death of Jesus and anybody that goes along with them. So it's kind of interesting, too, as a side note here, that you know Thomas is really the first one to say, hey, look, you know, Jesus is going to die. Let's go and do it with him. Um, Jesus gets there, runs into Mary and Martha. They're both broken. And um, you know this is where that classic line of Jesus wept comes into play. And what's interesting about this, too, is that Jesus was mourning with them. He knew very much so what he was going to do. He told them, I need to go and wake him up. So he knew when he was going there. He knew exactly what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. It, that really wasn't what he was weeping about, but he was mourning with them. And I think that this is a, um, a powerful 
uh, uh, piece of information when you know comforting you know somebody that is broken and whatever that particular situation is is um, to mourn with them and even knowing that uh, there is uh, light at the end of that tunnel um, to mourn with them so um, Jesus goes through this process and um, at the end of that he you know goes and raises Lazarus from the dead Lazarus has been dead four days at this point and um, it was pretty convincing that uh, he was not going to be getting back up but Jesus actually does come in and do exactly what he says he's going to do and right raises Lazarus from the dead this information does get back to the Pharisees and they do start um, a uh, process of determining how they are going to deal with Jesus and how they're going to um, catch him up so to speak so Jesus rides into Jerusalem and um, they're uh, shouting, you know, Hoshana, Hoshana, which is, um, or Hosanna, which is actually liberator. So they're shouting this as he's coming in. So expecting, you know, the liberator to come in. Um, you know, it's interesting too, is as he does, you know, come in, he actually comes in and starts, you know, whipping the money changers. And, the, you know, the challenge with this is that the expectation for that was that, you know, he was, you know, really supposed to go the other side of this. He wasn't supposed to be coming in and, you know, beating on the on the on the Jews. He was supposed to go the other way with this and start, you know, beating on the Romans and getting the Roman oppressors out of there. Um, you know, that didn't happen. And, you know, it's not too long from this point when, you know, Jesus is actually sitting on trial and uh, there's an option for another man to be released. And uh, they uh, choose not to release uh, Jesus they actually choose to release a freedom fighter or a murderer um, in the Romans' eyes. And um, you can kind of almost see how the, the crowd had turned at that point. You know, they were expecting this liberator to come in, Hoshana, Hosanna, to come in and do this liberation. And it didn't it didn't work the way that they were expecting it to work. The the way that they were seeing Jesus was not the way that Jesus had come. He'd come as the you know as the, the servant that, that has come to die, actually. And they didn't realize that or understand that. So their expectation was very, very much so different. So when given the choice between either, you know, Jesus, this, you know, pacifist, so to speak, that was, you know, pretty much not going to fight or do anything that they had expected him to do versus this other man, they went with the other man. So, but you can kind of understand, you know, the options given, you know, what their position was on that. Um, we see this whole process start to come into place that takes us into, uh, and we got a little bit of ahead of ourselves there, but we go back into Jesus entering in Jerusalem and now he's in and he, we have the, uh, uh, Passover meal and at the meal he's uh, actually washing the feet of his disciples and he's showing his character and what the expectations are from us and what we're supposed to be doing in, in relation to what um, his mission is and that is you know basically to serve unconditionally and serve faithfully and um, you know with our whole heart love love uh, he says he come he came with a new commandment and that is to you know love our neighbors as we love ourselves so so we go into that, um, we start to see where Jesus is, you know, starting to lay stuff down. He also, too, you know, clearly very clearly picks out um, Lazarus as the uh, one that's going to betray him and sends him on his way to start that whole process. Uh, we also hear in this section where the Holy Spirit is actually going to be given to us, where Jesus is very clear about what's going to happen and how it's going to happen and exactly what that spirit is going to do and you know another interesting side note in here is it's going to uh, help them to remember every everything that he said so you know oftentimes it's something too that kind of comes up but you know one of the interesting pieces in here is that jesus said point blank that the holy spirit is going to help you guys to remember everything that i said so when the information started being notated and documented it, it's uh it's it's interesting that uh, there was a, a piece that was provisioned for that as well. So that uh, pretty much takes us up to the um, the the nuts and the bolts of where we're at for this particular section of this week's reading, which is basically nine through chapter fourteen. So that kind of summarizes that. 
that takes us into the um, questions that are associated to it. So we've got John uh, 10, 22 through 33. The Jewish leaders ask Jesus if he is the Messiah and then threaten to stone him for blasphemy. And what does this show about their confusion regarding the messianic prophecies? So we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, the Again, the expectation here was that he was going to be a conquering hero, much like in uh, Psalms chapter 2, um, uh, where he was you know, coming in as this authoritative figure that was you know, going to set up this new um, era of reign. Um, and um, or even Second Samuel 7, for example, uh, the, the, this new leader that's going to come into play. And their expectation um, up until this point, and when you kind of go back through the history and what had taken place, and really what, what they were expecting isn't unexpected, I mean, or un, un, unreasonable. It, what they were expecting is, is pretty much what had been time and time again. I mean, look at kind of what was happening in Judges. You, you kind of got into this cycle where they were doing really, really good, and then all of a sudden they weren't doing really good, and when they didn't do really good, then they got oppressed, and when they uh, when they finally realized that the oppression was was uh, due to their sin, then they repented, and then after they repented, then the oppression went away, and they were redeemed, and suddenly they were doing really, really good, and then the whole cycle repeats again. And if you really look at Judges, for example, I mean, that really kind of gives gives you a, a, a prediction of what's going to be happening for the rest of the Old Testament. It, it shows you um, in a very small little piece exactly what it is going to be happening next. And what's going to be happening next is this cycle that continues to repeat and repeat and repeat. So as you're looking at this, the and you kind of look at that cycle of, okay, well, this, we're just kind of stuck in this cycle. And now, you know, the next thing that should happen is now we've, you know, we've repented for our sins and we uh, know that you know, God is God and we're going to, you know, start, you know, living according to the law. And the Pharisees are being super strict about things. And, you know, we're seeing a, a very, you know, hard look at, you know, what's happening on the Sabbath and what's Jesus doing on these days. And, you know, the lawyers are really getting, you know, very, very fidgety about this whole process. But it, again, if you kind of look at the history and what had happened, it, it, it makes sense. It, it really makes sense. You know, what happens when you realize that you've done something bad? You try to do something, you know, you try to do good, but not only do you try to do good, but you, you, you try to um, you know, do good in multiple areas, maybe areas that you hadn't been focused on so much before. You might try to do, do a little bit better. So you see the same kind of process, you know, repeated time and time again. So with that kind of background in mind and knowing that in the past it's just been judges that have been raised or military, you know, armies that have been raised and throughout these armies and there was new conquest and that this is really all expected. This is what makes sense. But that's that's not how Jesus came. They were kind of, you know, kicking out Isaiah, you know, 53 through 54, which really, you know, clearly breaks down. Or even, you know, the Psalms 20 through, 20, uh, 20 through 23, it kind of breaks down exactly how Jesus is going to die and, and this, this whole new process that's going to take place. Um, so they were just were, were, they just had a really hyper focused vision on exactly who this Messiah was going to be. And, um, I hope that, you know, with the explanation, it makes a little bit more sense on, on why their vision was so canned. Um, and it's because it was a cycle. It would, this is the same thing that had happened time and time. How many times did we see in Judges? We saw, how many Judges do we see out of there? You know, it's the same, same deal. Just continue to go on and on and on. So um, this, you know, kind of helps to explain that. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and hit with that. So the... Jewish leaders ask Jesus if he is the Messiah and then threaten to stone him for blasphemy. What does this show about their confusion regarding the messianic prophecies? So again, they were looking for this conquering hero to come in, not understanding that this hero was going to conquer not just the oppressors, um, and not even specifically the oppressors, but more so um, sin itself and allow for this new opportunity for you to then be not oppressed by sin or separated from God through sin, but be able to have a covering that would then allow you to enter into God's presence. Um, this is very much so where the book of Leviticus starts to come back into play that we've already reviewed and shows the importance of what that covering is and what that atonement really meant and all the different pieces that had to be done in order 
order for this atonement to be put into place so that one person can enter into the Holy of Holies at one time a year. Um, with Jesus' death and resurrection, what we now have is this opportunity for us to enter into God's presence with um, just repentance, just just simple repentance. So um, it's a it's a beautiful um, new process that's been put into place. But again, not at all what they were looking at from a lawyer, uh, from a scribe, a Sadducees, or a Pharisee's perspective. They were looking at it again as this conquering king to come in as a physical person and boot out the oppression that was there and set up a new physical reign. They were looking at it a as a spiritual situation in the least tiny bit, or an eternal situation. They were seeing this as a very temporal, um, short-term sort of uh, perspective. So the next piece on this is uh, John 11, which is 33 through 37. Uh, the Jewish leaders remember Jesus' miracles. Do they believe Jesus is God or not? Um, and they don't. Uh, when it all comes down to it, they really start pressuring him. And as they start pressuring him in the uh, uh, Solomon's um, cathedral or temple area there, the question comes up where they just, uh, just want to know point blank. Look, you're, you're talking to us about sheep and, you, you know, there's all these different things, all these different, you know, the, the way, the truth, the light, you're, just what, what is it? Just, just speak plainly is really what this is all coming down to. And, you know, Jesus is going through and explaining to them that if you were a part of my flock, if you already were part of the promise you would have already heard the words that I said. You would already know the things that I'm talking about. And, you know, this is kind of one of those deals where Jesus point blank is saying that, look, you're not really part of the team, man, because if you were part of the team, then you already know who the captain is. And you clearly have no idea who the captain of this team is. So, uh, no, they... Um, did not um, understand and um, even as he was speaking these things it, it you know these are the same things that end up you know being turned um, as the tools to uh, actually uh, turn him over for uh, blasphemy so you know the, the challenge with it you have two a two-part challenge here where the the Pharisees and or this is where the lawyers kick in where they just had to be clever and Jesus saying that he is God, there's, there was no Roman law that said that he couldn't say that. He could say whatever he wanted to say in regards to those sorts of things. That's not an issue at all. But the part that became a challenge is when he mentions that he's the king of the Jews. This is now becoming not a spiritual thing. This is now becoming a temporal thing. And that's where the Pharisees took it. Um, they were taking it to this new area where they were saying he is the king of the Jews. He's claiming to be the king of the Jews again, expecting that this new king of the Jews is potentially going to bring a rebellion or an uprising into place because that's a, what the process had been. So they kind of leveraged the law in a way that was very, very clever in order to get what they needed to get done. Um, clearly very wrong because Jesus, it was not a blasphemy. It was not blasphemous at all. Jesus truly was the son of man. He was the son of God. He was God. He is the father. They are one. They are all, it's all one piece. So nothing that he said was inaccurate. He is, he, he is exactly who he said he was, is. Um, the, what's interesting, though, is that in order for him to be uh, persecuted, they, the Jews were not able to do that on there. They had, no, they had no legal right to do that on their own accord. What could be done, though, is he could be taken um, before uh, Rome, and then Rome could actually um, run through and do a, a, a persecution of him. But they needed a, a charge, and the charge that they used was that he was claiming to be the king of the Jews, which he absolutely um, is the king of the Jews and the world. Um, 
But as you can kind of see with the explanation, they were grossly misusing that and used it to a position where um, he ended up before Pilate even explaining the exact same situation where this is the charge. You know, this is this is what you're saying. I can't have you. I can't have you running around telling everybody that you're a king. It's just not gonna. I can't have you doing that. We've got Herod, dude. That I, we can't have that. And you know, Jesus's response to this is, I am a king, but it's not of this world. So it, it, you know, even. Pilate, you know, knows that this whole thing is nonsense. He even washes his hands of it. You know, he, you know, he scourges Jesus. Um, but you know, there's some, there's a, there's a, a, a back history to that as well, which would give you the opportunity to believe that it's very, very possible that he was doing this as a um, option to give Jesus a. Uh, freedom in this section um, that didn't actually take place though um, they still continue to the, the idea being that if he got a severe enough beating that maybe that they would relent the crowds would relent from um, the persecution or the options that were sitting there basically the Pharisees and the lawyers who got everybody pretty much worked up so, um, but that was not going to happen um, because, uh, again, he, the things that he was doing were miraculous. The Pharisees had realized that he was miraculous, and it was because he was doing these things that they were um, being concerned that potentially the Romans might kick in and there might be an issue with their own personal freedoms, the limited freedoms that they had under the Roman rule and oppression that they were currently under. So, as you kind of start... <clears throat> looking at this and some of the topicals and the bigger pictures that are kind of sitting in here and some of the concepts that are that are laying on the backbone, you, you start to see a little bit clearer picture of exactly you know what was going on and you know why there was a little bit of hair on this ball and why these charges got you know trumped up and why they got put up in the way that they were put up and um, you know how the lawyers were continuing to do lawyer stuff. You know what I mean? You, like when Jesus, you know was asked the question of, you know, you know, love thy neighbors, you love yourself. And, you know, immediately, lawyer pipes up. Well, who's your neighbor? Yeah, it's just something that you just, he was just kind of dealing with all the way throughout this process with each of the individuals as he went with it. So that's basically the, the core of that, you know, particular piece and the challenges that he was having with. Um, the next one goes into uh, John uh, 12, which is uh, let's see, John 12, 42 through 43. Uh, what is the sin committed here and why is it so dangerous? Uh, I need to look at that real quick. So let's go ahead and bring that up. What is John? What did I say? It's 12, Okay. Uh, nevertheless, many, even the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the, the glory that comes from God. Okay, so what was the sin there? Well... You know, ultimately, the sin there was the denial of Jesus Christ. I mean, if you just look at it very, very simply and very, very plainly, if you were to sit before God and God was to try you for something in that particular case, and what would you be tried for? Inevitably, they, you know, chose their own personal, you know, they chose themselves, you know, over God. They chose themselves over Jesus. They chose their own personal needs, wants, and desires over that of Jesus Christ. So, you know, they kind of put themselves, you know, first. But, you know, in the process for putting themselves first, you know, they also de denied who Christ was in that, same exact, in that same exact breath. So, you know, as you go through this, um, you know, the other piece of this is it references a very, you know, hard word in there, which is glory, which is where these men were then also too looking for it. You know, that divine glory, what was the ultimate sin that we saw that um, the Satan or the you know, Lucifer, or the devil actually had uh, in his heart is he wanted to be like the most high. 
you know, he, you couldn't be higher than God. He knew that. He knew that there wasn't anything greater than God. So his best hope would be to be equal to God, like God. But pride is is the key to that. You know, what was it that, you know, we start looking at with Adam and Eve? You know, that whole option of you could be like God. You could be like God. The same thing that, that Lucifer wanted is the same same game that he's was you know kind of spilling out onto the other side of this the same thing he's playing with 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 adam and eve um you know the the readings that we looked at in the old testament first and second yeah samuel you know hannah breaks down the whole concept of that book very very clearly in this idea of how god exalts the humble and brings low the prideful so you know pride is a big big deal to god um you know especially if you're in that place where you're taking you know glory from god or if you're a you know, a Pharisee, you know, which Jesus was railing on constantly because they should have already known who he is and who he was, you know, as opposed to living the law out, they should have been, you know, living the law according to the way it was written on their heart. And um, just a very hard, you know, distinction in what was happening there, you know, constantly Jesus was railing against the hypocrisy of of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers and the scribes. So, Basically, that takes us to the uh, you know third and the final question that we had in that particular section. Um, we'll go ahead and get ready to wrap this up in the final piece. And thanks for hanging in there. Okay, we are at the uh, tail end of this section for uh, week uh, 21 or lesson 21. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Psalms uh, 116 through 119 specifically. We're going to uh, jump into Psalms 118, 8 through 9, and again, uh, Psalms uh, 118, 22 through 24. The uh, 8 through 9 is, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The nations around me in the name of the Lord, or excuse me, all nations surround me in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. So we had two pieces here for um, David or for David, where he was separated um, from his throne, so to speak. Uh, first was with Saul, uh, where Saul chased him, and then the second was with his um, uh, son Absalom, where his son uh, Absalom uh, actually chose to um, take over the throne and then chased him. So we've got two pieces here that you know we're looking at. A, this is more so towards the tail end, and that's just to be more so on the Absalom side of things. And um, you know, again, we start. We still see David's heart. It, it truly hasn't changed. Everything still always points back to God, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the battle is that he's dealing with, or how he's fighting that fight, or whom he's fighting that fight with. It, it, it always comes back into this um, concept of who uh, David is humbled to and humbled by, and who he loves ultimately. And you know, who he loves is God, and that's where his heart is, that's where his um, thoughts are, his mind, his deed, his actions, everything always points to that particular location. So no matter where where you're at with it, it, it always, you know, David is always one that is um, continually striving um, to serve God the best that he can. In fact, you know, one of his prayers was that uh, God would show him the things that he's sinning that he doesn't even know. So he, he wanted God to show him about the sins that he wasn't even aware of, the stuff that he could be doing that is offensive to God that he doesn't even know. Um, you know, that's the heart of David. So that's basically in 8 and 9 what we're kind of looking at. When we get into 22 through 23, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So, again, even throughout it all, David has 100% confidence and trust that God's in control. He's the one that's managing this. He's working this process. Um, This is his good earth. It is his history. It is his world. 
Um, he is the author of history. Um, he is the one that rules in the affairs of men. I mean, it, it, it all comes down to that same concept that David is fully aware of uh, who is his provision, and he knows that it's God, very, very simply. So that takes us into um, the, and actually the question for that is, um, how does do are these verses referring to both David and Jesus? So, and that's in 22. So Jesus being the cornerstone, obviously, that the builders rejected. So Jesus was the cornerstone for this new covenant piece. The Pharisees, Sadducees, laws, and lawyers, and scribes all uh, chose not to receive him as such, um, created trumped up charges in order to get him pushed out of uh, his position of authority. And that basically kind of sums that particular piece up. The next is when we get into the Proverbs, and the Proverbs are 15, 20 through, 20 through 33. Fifteen. All right, we'll just go ahead and um, hand pick a couple of these. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Um, folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man understanding walks straight ahead. Uh, let's, see, let's grab another one here. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. So, you know, the, the Proverbs in general are um, predictions. Um, they're not laws. They're things that are good to live by. Um, you know, as we learned in the wisdom series, they kind of break down a couple of different pieces. One of those pieces is the idea that there is... Um, uh, if you do good, good things will happen. This is, in essence, Proverbs. We get into Ecclesiastes. We see that there is um, the race doesn't always go to the athlete, and the wise aren't always the richest. Um, we see that there's something else that's at play in this, which requires um, trust. Uh, the next piece of this is Job, and in the final piece of the Wisdom series, we um, are then given some more detail on why we trust. And we trust because... God is in control of everything from a universal level on down to the, you know, the wings of a butterfly, so to speak. So as you're looking at these different proverbs and going through these, you know, one of the questions is in here was, you know, can you pick one? Um, you know, I, I would definitely say the one uh, folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. So, you know, it. it Oftentimes when you're working, you know, with different people, you, you can kind of see some of the um, challenges that they're experiencing. And, you know, for some of us, it's very obvious, um, but for others, um, it's not. So it, you can see that separation when, you know, when you're on that other side of the fence um, and certainly when, when you've been on the other other side of the fence as well. So... Um, yeah, you, you, in the moment that you're living it, whatever that addiction or whatever that um, folly seems to be at the time, um, it feels good and it seems right. But um, when you do finally get, you know, things put in order, then you realize that it truly was folly and it was a waste of your time and energy. Uh, the closing question here is, um, how might the Holy Spirit be at work in the readings to unify and encourage us in our walk with the Lord and one another? Well, you know, the core messages that we were really jumping on today were the concepts of humility and pride and how important those things um, are and how important it is to be aware of those things. And I would definitely say that, um, you know, unification and encouragement, um, you know, one of the, the uh, hallmarks of that or, you know, contributing factors of that is going to be humility. 
um, where there's pride, then there's not going to be unity. There's going to be dissension. Um, where there's pride, there's not going to be encouragement. Um, there's going to be discouragement. So um, as you go through that and look at that, I, I, would, I would throw those two options up as the primary there. Um, the final here that we have is to uh, close your time in God's word with uh, prayer, thanking him for all he has shown us this week. So let's go ahead and do that. And we will uh, go ahead and call a close to lesson number 21. Uh, Father, we just thank you um, for this opportunity to just kind of spend some time with you and, and just kind of just get into your word and see what you were thinking and why you're thinking the things that you're thinking, Lord. And we just love you. And um, Father, we just uh, we just ask you to just kind of you know help us to reflect on the week and, and the things that you've taught us and how we can you know put those into play. You know the the book isn't just there for us to just kind of read and walk around. It's it's really for us to, to live. So, you know, Father, help us, you know, help us to be more um, humble, Father. And if there is pride in us, then, then Lord, uh, remove it and show us where it is so that we can work on it, Lord. Lord, we lift this up in your name. You're awesome. We love you. We can't wait to see you. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll go ahead and call that a close for this uh, session for 21. Thanks for hanging in there with us, and um, we'll see you next week.